What happened to this leading critic of Rwandan President Paul Kagame? Diane Reguara's brother joins us to shed light on the mystery. Finding solutions to the world's new reality. Water insecurity. And a new documentary tells the story of the missing chapter in American popular music history. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu. You at Info Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. Details are sketchy surrounding the disappearance of a leading critic of Rwandan President Paul Kagame. Diane Shima Ruigara has reportedly gone missing and her family says they fear for the worst. Rwandan police say they are investigating Ruigara for tax evasion and forgery. Police spokesman Theos Badege says officers searched the Ruigara family home in Kigali but dismissed reports that she had been arrested. Ruigara has repeatedly accused President Kagame of stifling dissent and criti criticized his Rwandan patriotic front near total hold on power. Electoral authorities barred Rigara from standing in August presidential vote, saying she had not submitted enough supporters' signatures and some of the names she sent to the commission belonged to dead people, allegations that she denied. Now joining me via Skype from Los Angeles, California, is Aristide Ruigara, a brother to Diane Ruigara. Mr. Aristide, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, Aristide, as we speak, have you been able to speak to any one of your family members? Oh, no, ma'am, I, I have not. I have not been able to join them since, since, um, since Tuesday. Tuesday is when we, we lost touch with them. And um, I know they've been taken away by police. Uh, and I have not been able to talk to them since. But as we've seen in the report, the police spokesman says that they are not holding them anywhere. They are denying allegations that they could be held by the police. Have you spoken with any Rwandese authorities to kind of try to help locate your family? I have not, and the police is lying. They're lying. They, they took my family and they, they ransacked the whole house. They... They took everything in the house, they took cash, they took documents, they took computers. As soon as they arrived, they took all the phones away. Uh, they wanted to, to cut off all communication. They, they're just behaving like criminals, the, the, and they're lying. But Aristide, how would you know that? What is your source of information since you are located here in L.A.? Yeah, they, there was a witness to the events who let us know, and uh, I cannot identify the, the person for his security, but uh, it's, uh, it's very reliable what I heard. The, the person was a direct witness, and I know that for certain. They had them shackled the whole day on Tuesday. They broke my mother's arm. They broke her back. They had them shackled the whole day while, while they took everything in the house. Uh, the, the police is telling, uh, the police is telling nonsensical stories about tax evasion and a forgery on a sister spot. That is all made up. They're trying to create a case, and uh, it's all made up. It's all part of the repression that, that's been going on against my family for years and years. So, uh, Aristide, have you been able to speak, say, to extended family members who may be able to find out where your immediate family members could be? Uh, I, I, I've been able to, to speak with, with a few people in Rwanda, but they, 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 they had they are not able to, to find out anything that's happening. Now, what is, when is the last time you spoke to Diane, and uh, did she express any fears of any kind? Well, the, the last time I spoke with her, I mean, I'm constantly in touch with them on WhatsApp. So prior to this disappearance, we were uh, constantly in touch. And the fear, she didn't have any fear. She, she knew the worst could happen. Uh, but this happened sort of, an, I mean, sh she had a general fear, mm -hmm. given that she had spoken out against the regime, so uh, she, she, mm -hmm. I don't believe the consequences come as totally as a surprise, but she, wow. mm -hmm. well, I'm, now, well, 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 I'm sorry, uh-huh. All right, Aristide, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to say we wish you luck and we hope that they turn out to be safe. Thank you, Aristide, for talking to us. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.
Aristide Regara is a brother to Diane Regara, a fierce critic of Rwandan President Paul Kagame. Now, the World Food Programme is calling for more resources to assist over a million people displaced by conflict in the Kasai region of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Some 1.4 million people have been forced to flee their homes since August 2016, with tens of thousands crossing into neighboring Angola. Violence has raged across much of Congo this year, killing hundreds and displacing millions since the start of an, an insurrection nearly a year ago by the Kamwina Safu militia, which wants the withdrawal of military forces from the area. The WFP launched an emergency operation to provide food assistance to 42,000 food insecure people in Kasai area. The plan includes providing assistance to 25,000 displaced persons in Kasai Central and 17,000 people in the Kasai province in the coming weeks. Thousands of people have been killed here in Kasai, more than a million displaced. Uh, the international community needs to step up to the plate and help these people. There's a lot of things going on in the world, a lot of resources that are being asked of the international community, but these people's lives value just as much as anyone else's in any other crisis. Hunger is on the rise here. If we don't act now, then it's going to get a lot worse, and we're going to see ourselves in the same situation as in the other places that desperately need our help. In June, the Catholic Church reported that Congolese security forces and a militia fighting them had killed at, at least more than 3,000 people in the central Kasai region since October. Nigeria is getting the much-needed military and aid and foreign, from foreign governments to fight Boko Haram insurgency. On Wednesday, British Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson visited the troubled Nigerian city of Maiduguri as Britain looks to increase support to Nigerian forces looking to rebuild the region after years of conflict with Boko Haram. Johnson was joined by International Development Secretary Priti Patel on the visit as Britain looks to take a leading role in the international response to the humanitarian crisis. Britain has so far trained over 28,000 Nigerian military personnel, many of whom have been deployed on counter-insurgency operations in the country's northeast. What we're trying to show is, of course, the joined-up approach that the government is taking to this crisis. You've seen the suffering of the people of Nigeria, the, the victims of, of Boko Haram, uh, but, and, of course, you're seeing what we're doing with food aid to help those who have been uh, driven away from their, their villages and from their homes into the, into the camps. But what we're also trying to do uh, with our diplomacy and with our military forces is to help turn the tide against Boko Haram uh, get the country back under control, help the Nigerian military. I think we've trained 28,000 troops. Now, Boko Haram militants have launched frequent attacks in northeastern Nigeria, killing more than 20,000 people during its eight-year insurgency. Now, the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders began in 2014. It is the flagship program of the Young African Leaders Initiative that empowers young people through academic coursework leadership training and networking. This year, the fellowship has provided 1,000 outstanding young leaders from sub-Saharan Africa with the opportunity to sharpen their skills at a U.S. college or university with support for professional development after they return home. And joining me in the studio is Sharon Baranga, a Yali fellow and a television reporter for the Nation Media Group in Kenya. Ms. Baranga specializes in education and children's affairs. Sharon, a very warm welcome to you to Africa 54. Thank you for this opportunity. Now, Sharon, let's start with your passion for raising awareness for children's education and the challenges facing children's education in Kenya. What have you been able to see as a reporter as you go on the ground? Um, Kenya is very diverse. We have children who are privileged to grow in urban areas who have access to most of the things that um, can contribute to quality education. And apart from that, we also have another side of Kenya, the remote areas, where children lack the basic necessities such as books, pens. And so through my stories, I seek to highlight or voice out the issues that such children are going through and uh, try to see how we can help them 
through my stories. I am concerned. I was in Kenya recently and I visited one of the schools with uh, children who have disabilities and I'm concerned about one of the issues I had is that uh, they, have, they sit for the same national exam, mm -hmm. they're expected to perform the same way, mm -hmm. but they don't have the special needs that can enable them to compete effectively with the other mm -hmm. uh, children. What do you make of that and what does the Ministry of Education in Kenya need to do to up its game on that? I, be I believe all that is changing in future because right now we are having the, car the piloting of a, a new curriculum reform that began last year. So the piloting started in June this year and by 2018 um, the reforms will kick out through across the country. So part of the reforms inside this new curriculum will be to have resources for kids who have special needs and at the same time um, just a nurture talent also. It is not going to be purely academic like what we've had in the past because what we are facing out is the 844 system that has been um, in operation for the last 30 years which is not really um, adding any value to the children right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're also involved in uh, civic leadership issues and you've been reporting on, on this and it's interesting that Kenya mm -hmm. just concluded the general elections with a hotly contested presidential election. Mm -hmm. How important is civic leadership for Kenyans? Um, civic leadership is just all about um, contributing your skills, knowledge or volunteering time to enhance or improve the quality of the, of lives of the people living around you. And I believe the leaders who have been um, elected to whatever elective posts should take up their mandate and um, just seek to nurture and uh, improve the quality of lives of uh, Kenyans from across the country because we have different issues, people are facing different issues depending on where they are coming from and they need help. And politics is very much important in uh, addressing some of these issues. Now, you have attended a college here in the United States. You have sharpened your skills, as we see mm -hmm. with all the Mandela Fellows coming here. Mm -hmm. What do you plan to do with the skills that you have attained here in the U.S. that will better the Kenyan uh, people? Mm -hmm. First of all, something was birthed here. Um, myself and three other Fellows are planning to start an initiative that is going to contribute or the main focus of the initiative will be to um, provide stationaries to some of the schools in the rural areas that are lacking in this and then also rehabilitate some of these schools and uh, the initiative will be in Kenya, Mozambique, Senegal and Angola. So that's one of the things that was birthed out of this fellowship and aside from that I um, still want to go back home and continue producing the stories that I've I have been producing that, has, that is going to make an impact uh, to the lives of the children in Kenya. So you plan on uh, doing more TV work on that? Yeah. Thank you very much Sharon for talking to so us. Sharon Baranga is a Mandela Washington Fellow and a television reporter for Nation Media Group in Nairobi, Kenya. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on BOAAfrica.com. Coming up, possible solutions to the growing problem of water insecurity. Stay with us. And welcome back. In today's health report, researchers have found compounds in chocolate that they say could help prevent and treat type 2 diabetes. Better cells inside the pancreas are responsible for secreting insulin, the hormone that regulates blood sugar levels. In someone suffering from type 2 diabetes, the better produce insufficient levels of insulin. Researchers at Brigham Young 
University in the U.S. have discovered that compounds found naturally in cocoa called epicatechin monomers are able to increase the ability to, of beta cells to secrete insulin. The team says the compound successfully helped mice on a high-fat diet to cope with elevated blood sugar levels as well as de decrease the extent of their obesity. The study was published in the Journal of Nutrition Biochemistry. Now, according to the Water Project, more than 700 million people do not have easy access to clean, safe water. Solving that problem is the focus of an annual meeting of NGOs, charities and government leaders. VOA's Kevin Enoch reports. One in nine people in the world do not have access to safe, clean drinking water. That is why governments, NGOs and charities gather in Stockholm, Sweden each year for World Water Week. The theme for 2017 is water and waste, reduce and reuse. Todd Gartner from the World Resources Institute is in Stockholm and spoke to us by Skype. Uh, something like, I think it's only four or five percent of wastewater is being recycled for any useful purpose. Um, and over 90 percent of wastewater is just raw water, right? You obviously have some nutrients and metals and other things that you need to filter out, but the technology is increasingly becoming available to treat and reuse that wastewater. Gartner says that simple step could have a big impact, and the proof is that in some places it is already happening. You know, even for, even for potable water, and there's a lot of places where they're treating the water to drinkable standards, and if you think about that as an option, it dramatically reduces our need to rely on fresh water each time. But treating wastewater does not just help us. It helps the environment by keeping waste out of streams, rivers, and the ocean. 80% of wastewater across the world is not treated at all, which means that it's running into oceans and bays. Another problem is we are using more water than we have. USC professor Sarah Feekins also spoke by Skype. It's, it's well known that the groundwater table level is dropping because of all the water that's been used for agriculture. And that means that actually we can't keep doing what we're doing for a very long time. We have to actually change what we're doing. For Gartner, that means a combination of low-tech solutions like reforestation and fixing leaky pipes and high-tech approaches like desalination plants and advanced irrigation techniques. You know, water is a human right. Um, and so we want to make sure that everyone has access to clean, timely, plentiful water. Um, right now, we are not allocating it in a way that would suggest it is a human right uh, and that everybody deserves their equal share. But in the short term, Gartner says water insecurity and not having enough for everyone will be part of our reality. Kevin Enix, VOA News. Israeli scientists have developed a peptide that could be used in antimicrobial medicines, which could help treat infections in a post-antibiotic era. VOA's Faith Lapidus has more. The growth of antibiotic resistance, according to a British report, has led to 700,000 deaths annually around the world. The last new class of antibiotics was identified in 1984. During the past two decades, researchers have turned to peptides to fight resistant bacteria. Antimicrobial peptides are chains of amino acids the body produces as a first line of defense against infection. Tzvi Hayuka led a team at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem that synthesized peptides with a random mix of amino acids rather than the defined structure of natural peptides. Instead of adding one amino acid, we're incorporating two or three or four amino acids in each position, and then we generate a combinatorial library that will contain many, many different sequences, slightly different sequences in our pool. And when we expose the bacteria to this kind of compound, we can see that they have very good activity and they can inhibit the growth of bacteria. Their compound was visibly effective against both types of bacteria, gram-positive, like C. difficile, and gram-negative, like E. coli, as well as antibiotic-resistant strains, like MRSA. As you can see here, this is a B. subtilis bacteria that on, on these dicks we added our uh, compound, and you can see very easily the inhibition zone that prevent the growth of the bacteria near 
our compound. Ayuka's team hopes to begin clinical trials soon. I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. VOA News. It's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54, honoring the contributions of Native Americans to American pop music. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Dominos and Ford are teaming up to see if customers will warm up to the idea of pizza delivered by driverless cars. Starting Wednesday, some pizzas in Domino's hometown of Ann Arbor, Michigan, will arrive in a Ford Fusion outfitted with radars and a camera that is used for autonomous testing. A Ford engineer will be at the wheel, but the front windows have been blacked out so customers won't interact with the driver. Instead, people will have to come out of their homes and type a four-digit code into a keypad mounted on the car. They, they will open the rear window and let customers retrieve their order from a heated compartment. The compartment can carry up to four pizzas and five sides, according to Domino's Pizza. Next up is launching its latest sports-focused smartwatch at the IFA Technology Show in Berlin. The Samsung Gear Sport is a compact, waterproof smartwatch with built-in GPS tracking. The Gear Sport's high waterproof rating, which means you can go swimming and even diving with it on the wrist. It also comes with integrated GPS tracking so you can track running, and cycling without the device being tethered to a smartphone. Samsung is also using the annual technology show to launch its latest, latest fitness tracker, the Samsung Gear Fit 2 Pro. The new device is waterproof and can track swimming. It also has an auto detection system which will sense what sport you're doing and start tracking that automatically. And finally, a Taiwanese company is aiming to make laser engraving available to anyone by creating a device that comes at a fraction of the costs of conventional laser engraving tools. Kubio, the name of a device which resembles a small Bluetooth speaker rather than a tool for shooting lasers, is currently able to load images from a memory card and engrave them into various objects. According to its inventor, a future update of the app which controls the device will allow users to send photographs and graphics for engraving to the device directly via smartphone. This function will be ready before Cubio starts shipping next year. And that's what's trending today. Now, American music is loved throughout the world. Our next story reviews a new documentary feature that traces the origins of rock, jazz, and the blues. The film shows how Native American Indian music was blended with African music throughout American history. It is the missing chapter of how American music evolved. VOA's Caroline Turner has more. recognize the music and rock stars in Rumble, the Indians who rocked the world. The filmmakers treat us to archival and concert footage, and the story is told by the iconic music legends who knew and played with the musicians that inspired them. 
1958, Link Bray made history with his revolutionary power chord feedback style guitar classic, which was banned from the radio for fear it would incite violence. I think Link Ray purely loved rock and roll and felt pissed off and annoyed and disappointed that in some ways, because he was Shawnee, half Shawnee, and his family had been treated so badly, he took that bitterness and created it into something that was not reductive, but proactive. There was a song came on the radio, a guitar instrumental, and it changed everything. Link Ray, it's rock and roll. Rumble. Yeah, that's the one. Rumble. Hey, Rumble. Rumble had the power to help me say, I'm going to be a musician. And then I found out that he was an Indian. The music that we know here in the United States is fully supported by input from native and indigenous people. Mr. Randy Casillo! Randy had become one of the most influential heavy metal drummers in the world. This is Jesse Ed Davis. I just particularly fell in love with Jesse Evan Davis. He was with Taj Mahal, and Taj's album is what spurred me to rock more. The filmmaker, Catherine Bainbridge, says the music is loved because it comes from the heart. The violence and oppression, of course, against people of color, though, was like off the hook. And out of that violence comes this beautiful music. Comes the, because music is like a healing bomb, right? When everyone says the blues, blues isn't sad. It speaks about what's going on so people can feel healed. So people can feel they can handle what they're having to endure. The film deconstructs America's violent history and the origin of American music, blues, jazz, rock, and folk. It traces the influence of Native American Indian culture as it blended with African American and follows the evolution of the music. You can hear the spirit of some of the old music before plantations and slavery and so forth and colonization. People are really shocked when they hear the traditional music of the South, East. They're like, that's Indian music? I thought that was African music. The film reveals how American music has so much power. As Indians and slaves mingled, the music that emerged was a result of the blending of America's violent and rich cultural history. Carolyn Turner, VOA News. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC and in the mornings to Daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks for watching and a very good night from Washington. to English in a Minute. Today's episode won't cost you anything. Freebie. Let's see what this one is about. Anna, I love my job. Oh yeah? Why is that? I get so many freebies from the bands I write about. CDs, t-shirts, water bottles, even tickets to see them perform. Wow. The only freebie I ever got from my